And so, Father, we pray that you'll help us to live our Christian lives standing on your promises, resting entirely on your word. We know that this is the only way to enjoy assurance of salvation is to rest on the forgiving word of pardon that Christ utters through his gospel. And Father, we pray that you will speak your word to our hearts as we read your word tonight. And as we seek to preach your word, oh, Father, we pray that we might receive your word. We ask that you will act upon our hearts in a powerful way through your word. Father, please replace fear with calmness. Please replace guilt with peace. Replace um, doubts with faith and work in us whatever need we have replace ignorance with knowledge replace foolishness with wisdom replace rebellion with submission do all these things and more father in our hearts we pray for this assembly and we think of the many needs that every local church has and we know some of them in this assembly we think of believers who you have called to go through difficult times We think of widows and widowers. We think of those who suffer with uh, long-term illnesses. And we we think of those who who maybe are going through phases where the devil is busy in their lives and trying to steal their joy and their confidence in your word. And we pray that tonight you would work to help and sustain the faith of your people. Lord, let us all hear you working and speaking to us tonight in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are back in Psalm 119 and talking tonight about how the Bible is for hunted Christians. And let's just quickly go over our key words. Maybe I can ask you tonight if you'd be comfortable just shouting it out. But um, when we think of the word law, What's our little cue? What do we think of when we think of law? Does anyone remember? Torah. Torah means teaching. Very good, Fred. For thinking it was the morning today, this evening, you're you're right on target. Commandments, we think of what word? Commander, which is the aspect of authority. Good job. Rules. What do we think of when we think of rules? Sorry, ruler, okay, yeah, rulings, rulings, a judge makes a ruling, and so you can think judicial decisions. These are all technical words that Psalm 119 uses to describe the Bible, and they're all meaningful. They all bring out a different aspect of some characteristic of the Bible, and so the word word, we think of what part of our bodies? The mouth, the mouth. And so, Seth, you're right. The spokenness of your word. In other words, our Bibles are not, you know, abstract from God. They're not impersonal things. But the Bible is the word of God that came from his mouth. He spoke God's word. And then, oh, sorry, I gave this one away. Statutes. you, You can all get this one. What do we think of when we think of statutes? Norman, you got it. Statues. That's right. And when we think of statue, that helps us remember that it's the idea of permanence. It's not going away. Today, we're going to read your word is forever settled in heaven. And that, oh, I did it again. Precepts. Precise. And so this is, I did it again. The relevance, the relevance of your word. Testimonies. What do we think of for testimonies. Anyone remember? Someone comes in court and they give testimony. And so this is the truthfulness of God's word. God's book, the Bible, is utterly truthful because he's the one who wrote it. And God is a God who doesn't tell lies. He's absolutely reliable in what he says. Okay, that was a quick review. And we're going to come to the scriptures here just in a moment. You can turn to the Lamed section. Remember that the word Lamed is 
is a strange word I know, and all the way through Psalm 119, you see these strange words, and all they are is names of the Hebrew alphabet, just like we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The Hebrew alphabet had A, B, G, D, and so on, all the way through until we get to the L in Hebrew, which is Lamed. And why do we have an L or a Lamed here? It's because every one of the 22 sections of Psalm 119 has eight verses in it, and every leading line in those eight verses begins with the same letter. This one here, every one of those verses begins with the Hebrew letter Lamet. And this poet has stuck himself in a corner. He said, these are the restrictions I'm going to abide by to make this piece of poetry. I'm going to limit myself like this. And often when we put limits within uh, on ourselves, that's when true freedom and creativity spills out. And that's what Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a beautiful psalm that looks at the Bible from every single different angle so that it is very comprehensive in its treatment of Psalm 119. And it's designed to be an environment in which we learn to pray the psalm and we learn to treasure God's word the way the psalmist did. And we've talked in the first night about the fact that often we see a huge gap between the words and expressions of this psalm and where we're at spiritually. And we've learned that when that happens and the psalmist expresses some amazing level of love for God's word and commitment to obey it, that what we can do as Christians is we can remember that we have a Savior who could pray those words. And we can think, what did it mean for the Lord Jesus to say that? What did it mean for him to say, I rise up at midnight and praise your word? Well, we know that he prayed all through the night. The gospels say it. We know we do have a Savior who can say that. Say it with all his heart. And then as a Christians, we can say, Father... I'm so thankful I have a Savior who could say those words. And it's in him that I come to you and tell you that I want his love for the word to rub off on me. And I'd like my affections for your word to grow more like his. So that's, um, that's what we're doing in a big picture. But now let's come to tonight. About a year and a half ago, uh, an elder wrote to me and he said, he said, Mike, we, we feel the darkness closing in. And uh, that the day in which North American Christians will be uh, outrightly persecuted for their faith may not be far away. Anything you can say that would help us prepare for those days would be a blessing. And what I'm going to speak to you on tonight is the fruit of that request. I want to speak on how the Bible is for hunted Christians. The Bible is for hunted Christians. And, um, and so just look, I know we haven't read our passages yet, but just look at this. Verse 95 uh, says, the wicked lie in wait to destroy me. See, he's hunted. He's saying the wicked are up in their tree stands and they've got their high-powered rifles and they're ready to bring me down. He says, flip the page over and look at verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me. There's the wicked. They're up in their tree stands. They've got their rifles. They've dug some pits. They've covered it over with thatch. They've hung some bait. They've laid some snares. They've laid some mines, made the world into a minefield. They've booby-trapped the believer's world, and they're just waiting to bring him down. They're against him. They're opposing him. Why are they against him? What would the believer need to do to make all those guns go away and all those minefields get swept and all the snares put back in the shed? What would the believer need to do to make all that persecution and opposition go away? This is all he has to do is put his Bible down. That's all he's got to do. The reason he's under the crosshairs the reason he's being targeted is because he believes the Bible and because he wants to obey the Bible and everything can go away and he can settle into a nice, comfy, cozy with the world life if he'll just agree to put the Bible down. But this Psalm 119 believer, he says, no way. 
I'm not going to do it. Look at, um, where am I here? Look at verse 93. I will never forget your precepts. He's saying, I don't care if the whole world turns against me. I'm not going to forget your precepts. Look at verse 97. He says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I can't give up your word. Look at verse 103, 101, sorry. He says, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. And then finally, look at verse 112. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. And so here's a righteous believer writing Psalm 119. And there's people, wicked people, who are trying to get him. They want to destroy him. And all he would have to do so that he wouldn't need to live in fear anymore is put his Bible down and say, all right, I'll just privatize my faith. I, I won't insist on its truthfulness anymore. And then it all goes away. But he says, I'll never do it. And what we're wanting to learn from him tonight is how can we learn to be so confident in the Bible that no matter what persecution comes our way, we would never put the Bible down. We would rather be opposed. We would rather be ridiculed. We'd rather be imprisoned than to lay the Bible down and have a nice, comfy, cozy life with the world. What would it take? How could we get such a confidence as that? Well, let's read our verses tonight so that we can see what we can learn from this believer. Verse 89, just follow along, please, in, in the reading. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment or by your judgment, they stand this day. For all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Verse 93. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. The mem section. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Noon, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. May the Lord bless his word. Well, I want to talk to you about your phones for a second. Um, I just got a text saying that this was a problem. <clears throat> These phones of yours, do they work in here? Do they work in this room? You say, yes, they do. And it's a good thing, too, because sometimes my elders get the speaker in to do Psalm 119 for the week, and I'm so glad my phone works, because if things go bad, I can go on my phone. Do they work out there? Do your phones work out there in the world, in the street, in the school? Does it work? Does it connect? In the rink? In the gym? Yes, you say. My phone works out in the world, too. I mean, maybe... Maybe if I was like ice fishing way off in Delta somewhere, it wouldn't connect. But generally speaking, my phone works in the world. Well, I'm glad to hear that. What about, what about this? Does this work 
in here? Does it work in the meeting? You say, yes. Yes, it does. I've been in this room and someone will get up and will read God's word and will preach from it. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And I hear those words and God's spirit is speaking. And I think, oh, I can feel God's presence. I can hear him speaking to him. I can feel this conviction of sin. And I, I just know that God is real and that Christ is great and so on. Because the word works in meeting in the local church. Well, you know what I'm going to ask next, right? Does this work out there? Does this work out there in the world? Does the Bible work in the streets? Does the Bible work in the rink? Does it work in the gym? Does it work in the office? Because you see, sometimes we are in here and we hear the Bible and it seems to work and it seems so real. But then we step out the door and maybe we see a bunch of friends from school zipping by in their car with the music on. And all of a sudden, it doesn't seem so real anymore. I remember hearing John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word preached in the church. And it was powerful. And then I went into my electronics class in college and the professor got up. He didn't say a word. He starts writing on the chalkboard because that's what we used to have back then. And he wrote, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And then he turned around and he proceeded to mock the scriptures. And all of a sudden, it did seem a bit shaky, you know? Does the word work in the world? When our family was in California a few years ago, we were driving on these interstates that had more lanes than my hometown of Austin has roads, you know? Yeah. And so we're trying to get from here to there. And so we're taking the interstate that goes from here to there. But then we were using Google Maps on my phone and it would say, it would tell us to do the weirdest things. It would say, oh, there's a big accident up ahead. So if you want to get there, turn here, <laughs> turn here. And we would wonder about it but sure enough we'd turn there and we'd find ourselves on this little wee road with hardly anyone on it and vineyards everywhere and we could have put our hand out and hit mailboxes with our hands and we're thinking i'm not sure that this is the way to i don't know what it was we were going to but sure enough we would get there why because the world was as the map said it was the world was as the map said it was there was a tremendous correspondence between reality in the world and what the map said was. We could look at the little thing and say, oh, there's a lake there. Yeah, there's a lake here too, right? And there's a little turn here, and it was just like it was said. Just like it said on here, it was out in the world. And I'm here tonight to just say from this psalm that... Not only is the world as my map says, but the world is as the word says. The world is as the word says. And as we kept following our little Google map thing and seeing that there was a correspondence between the two, our confidence in it grew until we basically followed it unquestioningly. And this is the way that we will grow in our confidence too. When we learn to see that the world is as the word says it is. I've been helped a lot by Christopher Ashe in Psalm 119. And some of the illustrations and points are going to be owing to him. I want to state that publicly tonight. But he talks about Satan's big weapon room. He says, imagine, I mean, I'm doing this in my own language. But, but like, let's just imagine we got a tour of Satan's weaponry. And the tour guide took us to this really special place in the weaponry where all the chemicals are kept. And there's a chemical agent there, a very powerful weapon, and it has the letters on it, I-O-W-I-C. I-O-W-I-C. It only works in church. 
And the tour guide explains, this is a chemical spray that Satan loves to use just when you're getting all fired up about your faith. And you're in the meeting and you're thinking, yes, uh, I don't know why I would ever doubt this. It seems so real. It seems so powerful. God is. He exists. The gospel's true. There's a heaven and a hell. I believe it all. You know, and, and it's as if Satan comes along and he just powders you with a little bit of I-O-W-I-C. It only works in church. And you go out into the world and all of a sudden you think it worked in the meeting, but it doesn't work here. But we're going to learn tonight that the world is <clears throat> as the word says it is. So let's let's see this now in the scriptures here. We've got our um, Lamed section open. And what we're going to see here, brothers and sisters, is, is three things that... Um, uh, that that the Bible gives us three things. It gives us a stronger footing to stand on. That's the Lamed section. It gives us a stronger footing to stand on. It gives us a deeper wisdom to live by. And it gives us a brighter light to guide us. Okay? A stronger footing to stand on, a deeper wisdom to live by, and a brighter light to guide us. So let's see this. Look at verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. This is military language. It's as if you could go into heaven, and if you came to the place where God's word is posted on duty, you will never come there and find that the post is empty. And there's a sign saying, we're sorry for the inconvenience, but God's word has stepped out for 15 minutes, and we'll be back right with you shortly. You'll never see that. God's word is firmly fixed in the heavens. God sustains the universe by his word, and his word never takes a moment off. It's always on duty, standing on duty. It is eternal and secure and always doing its job. It's firm. Well, let's go on to the next thing that's firm. Look at verse 90. Not only is God's word firm, but look at this. Verse 90, your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. You see where we're at here? In verse 89, we have the word is firm. When we come to verse 90, we find out that the world is firm. And it is, isn't it? I think just a few days ago, there another space rocket went up, SpaceX or something launched something. And the world is so predictable. God so, you know, sustains the universe that years ahead, NASA can, can, can plan a, a little date with the moon. And it all works out. Everyone connects. Everyone arrives at the right time and place for the, the get-together. It's incredible. And so, and so we have two secure things. The word, verse 89, is, is secure. The world, verse 90, is secure. It stands fast. Now, here's the question. How are those two things related? How are those two things related? Which one is upholding the other? Well, look at verse 91. By your appointment, they stand this day. The word for appointment, the ESV chose to translate it differently, but it's the word judgment, which you see all through Psalm 119. It's another word for the Bible. It's another word for God's word. And he says in verse 91, it's by your judgment, it's by your word that they stand this day. Well, what does they refer to? They refers to the heavens in verse 89. They refers to the generations in verse 90. They refers to the earth in verse 90b. You see where we're at? We have the word is secure. We have the world is secure. And now when we come to verse 91, we find out that the one is secure because of the other. Why is the world secure? It's because it stands on the word. The world is firm because it rests on the foundation of God's word. This is why creation is so secure. <clears throat> the, the, by, the, the earth, the solar system, the universe is founded upon God's secure word. And so do you know what the rest of this stanza is saying? The rest of this stanza is saying, if the whole universe is secure because of God's word, 
then I'll only find stability and security for my life if I rest on God's word too. Look at verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. He says, verse 93, I will never forget your precepts for by them you've given me life. Verse 94, I'm yours, save me for I've sought your precepts. Verse 96, I've seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. We often think of the Bible as a narrow thing that limits our life, but this verse says it's exceedingly broad. True freedom is found in the constraints of God's word. And so, brothers and sisters, you see, you see what this man is saying. He's saying the world is as the word says it is. The security and stability of our universe rests upon God's word. I used to think it was the other way around. I used to think the world was a great big place and the Bible was this little thing, you know? But now I'm learning to see it the other way around. I'm learning to marvel. I went for a walk today just before meeting when there was a bit of sunlight left and took little doggy out and saw the hoarfrost on the trees. And it was amazing. And you just look at all this and you're thinking to yourself, wow, all of this exists and all of this is sustained and upheld. And all of this is secure and beautiful because it rests on God's word. It's incredible. Now look at how this works in real life. We live in a busy, busy culture, and we're slowly catching up to the realization that we can't live this way sustainably, that we need rest. Can't live seven days going hard. It's good to have a time of rest. Well, guess what the Bible says? The Bible says when you open the very first page of the Bible that God created the world with his words. And then on the seventh day, he rested because the world is as the word says it is. There was this commandment in the Ten Commandments that we all know. Thou shalt uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And when Moses, when God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, keep a day off a week. It linked it back to creation. It said, because that's how God created the world. The, the, the word that says, take one day off a week is the same word by which God created the world and rested on the seventh day. There's a correspondence. As the, world, as the word says it is, so is the world. And so, brothers and sisters, when we learn to live by God's word and take times of rest and not be burning the candle at both ends, constantly go, go, go. When we learn to take times of rest, what are we doing? We're living along the grain of the universe. We're living in harmony with the way we were built to be. We, we, we enter into true flourishing. We do better. Why? Because the world is as the, as the word says it is. Let's talk about the fact that we're sexual beings. And so um, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal, and this is the, what, what it was called. It said, too risky to wed in your 20s? Is it too risky to get married in your 20s? Not if you avoid cohabitating first. Why? Because the world is as the word says it is. In other words, this secular article in the Wall Street Journal of all places was observing that there is no problem, contrary to the myth, there is no problem if 23-year-olds want to get married. And they will have a very successful marriage. And at various points that we can measure and do statistics on and all that and surveys on, at various points, their marriage will thrive and succeed if they don't cohabitate first. And all of a sudden, this ancient, seemingly repressive document called the Bible that actually calls people to get married first and then live together, all of a sudden, it's vindicated, as it were, by secular media. Why? Why is it this, so that, that, that when we go in God's order, things statistically work better? It's because the world is as the word says it is. We look at our world today and, you know, there's such a rebellion against God's ways and 
And there's such a movement in, in the LGBT movement towards, for, for instance, transgenderism, right? And while we have tons of sympathy for those who would have conflicted feelings and, and where their feelings don't match their body and so on, we'd have tons of sympathy for that. But when it comes to an agenda to actually change and mutilate people's bodies to make the, the, the physical thing conform to, to the feeling, then, then we, we just see how the world is, is running into the brick wall of reality. There's this movement towards favoring these, these agendas, but then it shows up in the swimming pool at international competitions. And, and suddenly there's this conflict between feminism, which wants to be pro-women and, and see women succeed in sport, and it runs head-on collision into this other agenda. And you just see that what's going on here is that people are rebelling against God's word, and when you rebel against God's word, you, you bump up against reality. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because the world is as the word says it is. And so, brothers and sisters, this can give us confidence to, to put our weight on the, on the word of God, as the Lord Jesus said, that the wise man or the wise woman is the one who hears these words of mine and does them and builds his life on them, builds his life on the rock, because when the storms come, your house will not fall. Why? Because the world is as the word says it is. This nerves us, this steals us, this strengthens us. This says, you know what? If persecution comes, if everything I hold dear in that Bible is ridiculed in this world, I still won't cower and bow the knee and give in to modern agendas and so on because I'm convinced that the world is as the word says it is. Just like I learned to grow more confident in my Google Maps because it just kept it just kept conforming, right? It, it, there was just such a correspondence between the world and, and, and the map. So it is, as we go through life, we learn to spot that the world is, as the Bible says it is, our confidence in it will grow. Secondly, not only does the Bible give you um, uh, a stronger footing to stand on, but secondly, it gives you a deeper wisdom to guide you. We'll do this one and the next one much quicker. The Bible, secondly, gives you a deeper wisdom to guide you. Look at verse 97. <clears throat> oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And then verse 98, your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. Verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Verse 100, I understand more than the aged. The, the Bible, in other words, says this believer is making me wiser than my enemies, and it's teaching me more so that I have more understanding than the aged and than the teachers. In other words, this man is saying, if you believe God's word, you'll have a deeper wisdom than the experts in your classroom. You'll have a deeper knowledge than your teacher will in the classroom. Why? because the world is as the word says it is. You're going to come to your class and you're going to think, I can learn a lot from my professor. I can learn tons from her. She is so smart and she is an expert in her field and I'm going to learn tons from her. But there's a sense in which I already know more than her. And that's not going to lead you to be arrogant or odious or obnoxious. In any way, you're going to be humble in that classroom, I hope. But there's going to be a sense in which you, there's going to be a sense in which we're going to know more than some of the justices on the Supreme Court. Why? Because you and I know how to define a woman. And if you're aware of recent news events over the last year or two, there are people in the Supreme Court who are unable to speak to that question. Cannot give simple answers to simple things because they're not willing to submit to this Bible. But we are able to give answers to these things. You're, you're going to go into a psychology class and you're going to learn tons about human behavior and much of it very, very helpful 
and very true, but there's an aspect in which you're already going to know something deeper than your professor knows. Why? Because you've read Mark chapter 7, where Jesus says that it's out of the heart that proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and so on. You're going to have an insight into the nature of the world and into the nature of fallen mankind that goes beyond, that enables you to see more clearly some, than some of, of the experts in this world. And so we come to this book and, and we realize this book gives me a superior wisdom to live by. This book gives me resources around which I can structure my marriage, resources in which I can keep relationships harmonious, resources by which I can bestow forgiveness and patch up things that go wrong and so on. This book gives me a deeper wisdom to live by. I don't know. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, that this makes a little bit of sense to you. Um, but if you expose yourself a little bit, you'll find out that there's extremely brilliant people in this world who, who are in some ways absolutely ignorant. One fellow um, who's become a Christian, his name, his last name is Budachevsky. Can't remember his first name right now. But he looks back on his early life. He was brilliant. PhDs, he was brilliant. And he said, you know what? I was living my life by such a stupidity that I had to be incredibly smart to pull it off. The only way I could, I could live so blindly was to be really, really smart at it. And now, thankfully, God opened his eyes, and now he's living by the Bible because he's got a superior wisdom to live by. And then thirdly, not only a stronger ground to stand on or, or a superior wisdom to live by, but a brighter light to guide you. This is the noon section now. A brighter light to guide you. Look at the very first verse in this uh, section, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The idea of the lamp is more like a flashlight, right? For, for right in front of you. And then the second word, a light, is more like the headlights on your car that really beam out. And this man is saying that the Bible gives him this brighter light to live his life by. And isn't it true that we need a light to guide us? Does anyone here feel the darkness, confusion? Which way is up? Which way is down? Where do I turn? Where do I go? We're, none of us is wise enough. None of us has enough wisdom of our own that we can be our own light, that we can be our own guides. We've got one crack at this life and we need a light to live by. I remember um, coming through fog into one of the airports in the States, maybe it was Minneapolis, and just being impressed with how lonely it was in the world, how we, we were in thick, thick, soupy fog, and you could see so little, but there was this light on the wings or something, and, it's, and it was blazing through a little bit, piercing through a little bit of the fog. And that's how life is in this world. It can be so dark. We don't know where to turn. We don't know where to go. We need a light to live by. And the Bible is that light because the world is as the word says it is. This book can guide us. And so come down to verse 110. It says, the wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. You see, this light that the psalmist has he, he carries it with him, and he's walking through this world with his light. And he, he comes across this, this thing that looks really alluring. But when he shines the light of God's word on it, he realizes it's actually a snare. That the enemy has baited him. And it looks so good, and it feels so good. But he knows if I eat it, if I take it, if I put my hand and grab it, I'm a goner. I'm going to be taken down. And so the word, the word shines on it. Um, you're, you're going through life and you're a sister. And all of a sudden, this really great looking proposal comes your way in the form of a young man. And it looks so good. And it feels so good. 
but you've got this light to guide you. And the light enables you to see what otherwise you would never see. You understand that this man is not a believer. And you, you say, I trust this light. I trust this guidance system. As, as alluring and as attractive and as wonderful this looks like, and, and it seems to promise me great joy and satisfaction and blessing in this life, I've got a light here that exposes this for what it is. And it could lead to a life of great hardship, of great misery. And so the believer, she says, no, I'm not going to fall to the snare. I'm going to keep living because the Bible says I'm only to marry another Christian in 1 Corinthians 7. Or an attractive offer comes. Even though the work, dear brother, isn't really suited for you, you're more suited for this other kind of work, but it pays so much and it would offer you such advancement. It doesn't really fit you. It's not really fitting the way God made you and gifted you, but it if you just really poured your heart into it and, and gave your heart and soul to it, you would have money coming in like crazy and promotions coming in like crazy. But you've got this light called the Bible. And it teaches you that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils and that the love of money is a snare. And you say, you say, you know what? In this case, I think I'll stick to the work that I feel God has called me to, even though it doesn't pay as much. Because this light is guiding me. It's showing me, as attractive as this is, the light is showing me that this is actually a snare. And so, brothers and sisters, we have a deeper light to, to go by. Look at, just look at this, where this leads. We're going to wrap up here in just a moment. Look at verse 111. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Did you know that the ancient Israelite, he could turn to this book and he could turn to say like Joshua 19 and he could literally read about his inheritance in Joshua 19. He could, he could look at where he lives. Maybe he's a Zebulonite and, and here he is. He's in the area of Zebulun. And then he opens the Bible to Joshua 19 and he says, there's Zebulun. There's my inheritance right there. And, it's, and, and, and my inheritance in this earth, in the world, is as the word says it is. And here our psalmist says, your testimonies are my heritage forever. And as we read God's word, just like the ancient Israelite can, can open up the Bible and say, I have an inheritance here in Joshua 19. And lo and behold, it's just as it says it is here in the world. So you and I, we can turn to places like Ephesians chapter 1 and say that by faith in Christ, we have received an inheritance. In the world to come, in the new heavens and the new earth, there's a plot of land and the property deed is made out to you, dear believer, made out to you. You have a stake because not only is the world today as the word says it is, but the world to come is as the word says it is. And as believers who are pilgrims and strangers headed for a new land, headed for our true home, headed for a new world, a new heavens, a new earth with an inheritance in there, when persecution comes, when people ridicule the beliefs that the Bible teaches us to hold, we say, no, no, I will not cower. I will not compromise because I have an inheritance in the world to come. Just look at, look at how beautiful this is that we can think about the Lord Jesus praying these words. Look, look back at the mem section for a moment. Picture the Lord Jesus. Remember in Luke chapter two, he's, uh, he's been in the temple and he's been asking these questions and he's been answering these questions in such a way that the, the, the aged and the teachers and the scholars of Israel are marveling at his wisdom. And then the Lord Jesus goes home and he submits to his parents and just picture him going into his bedroom. And he prays verses 97 to 100. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. 
Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. I have more understanding than all my teachers. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. The Lord Jesus, he fully trusted in God's word, and he loved it with all his heart, and as a result, he was wiser than the wisest in Israel. He had more understanding than the greatest scholars in Israel. And the Bible can give you a deeper wisdom too, can give you a deeper understanding too. And then the Lord Jesus, he could come to the noon section. Maybe, maybe he could come to the noon section, verses 105 to 112, after, after Satan had planted Peter in front of Jesus as an obstacle to Jesus' path to the cross. And, and, he, and Peter could say to, to the Lord Jesus, you know, let that thought be far from you. Think no such thing. But Jesus would overcome this. And he would understand that this is a snare. This is a snare from the devil. He could say, the wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Why? Because your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And then finally, the Lord Jesus could come to verse 112. And you know, I like to picture the Lord Jesus praying these words in heaven this very night. Having fully obeyed God's word here on earth and having ascended up to heaven, he can say still to this day what he could have said here on earth. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. This is the ultimate reason we have for confidence in God's word. Because the very one who upholds the universe by the word of his power is in heaven tonight. The one who upholds the universe by his word has given his word that he will always keep God's word. And it's in him that we live. It's in him that we have our confidence. Oh, I'm so thankful that I have a great high priest a great representative, a great savior and leader and Lord in whom I'm found tonight. I, I will waver in my faith. I will have times of doubt. I will have times where I don't fully trust God's word, where it points out a snare, but I go for it anyways. I will have times of failure, disobedience to God's word and so on. But I have someone in heaven who has given his word that he will always keep God's word. And thus our salvation is secure because it rests in the Lord Jesus and his sinlessness, his holiness, his commitment to God's word. Let's pray. Father, we ask that these truths from Psalm 119, about how the Bible gives us this secure footing to stand on and this deeper wisdom to live by and this brighter light to, to, to guide us. We pray that these truths would cause the the word of god to rise higher in our values and that we would become increasingly confident in its reliability that as we navigate this world we discover over and over that the world is as the word says it is and that it's when we stick to the word of god that we find ourselves living along the grain of reality living in keeping with the way things are living in keeping with the way you've made things to be. And so, Father, we pray that our faith would be strengthened and that as the world and as Satan tries to uh, rebel further and further against your truth, that we would be willing to be persecuted, we'd be willing to be hunted for the sake of your word, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to learn these truths so that we're ready for when we need them. We pray that you'll bless us all and bring us all home safely now. And Father, thank you so much for the Savior we have who can say, oh, how I love your word, and I will keep it forever.